Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is the Sony A6600, a mid to high end mirrorless camera with a 24 megapixel APS-C sensor, built in stabilization, unlimited 4K video, 11 frames per second burst with autofocus, and the longest battery life in its peer group. Announced in August 2019, it replaces the three year old A6500 as Sony's flagship body with an APS C sensor, and it costs $1,400 for the body alone. That's roughly similar to the Fujifilm X-T3 and a considerable $500 more than the unstabilized A6400 launched only 7 months earlier. Sony also announced the lower end A6100 body alongside the A6600 at a considerably lower body price of $750 and if you'd like to know more about that model check out my separate overview video. In this particular review video though, I'm going to show you all the pros and cons of the A6600, along with seeing how it compares to rival models, not to mention the other options in the growing A6000 series. If you find any of this useful, you can support my channel with a like and a follow. Thanks, and on with the review. At first glance, the A6600 greatly resembles its predecessor, with both bodies sharing essentially the same design, controls, and magnesium alloy shells with weather sealing. The major physical difference is the deeper grip to accommodate the larger battery, more about which in a moment. In terms of controls, I'd really like to have seen an AF joystick, while eagle-eyed Sony observers will also notice the A6600 now lacks a pop-up flash. In fact, it's the first A6000 model not to have one, with Sony's justification being that target customers will either be high-end video shooters or photographers who typically don't use pop-up flashes, but I still find them handy for quick fills and I, I miss it here. What do you think? To be fair, Fujifilm's X-T3 doesn't have a pop-up flash either, but at least it includes a small bounceable flash gun in the box. The A6600 becomes the first in the A6000 series to use Sony's high-capacity Z-series battery, and like the full framers to debut this pack, it transforms the camera in use. Sony quotes 810 shots under super conditions, roughly double that of the A6400 with the older battery, and a tad more than the full framers which use the Z battery. But I managed over 900 shots in a single charge, including several minutes of video and Wi-Fi use. In terms of video alone, I even managed to record a single 4K 24p clip lasting 3 hours and 25 minutes on a full charge. That was a single clip too. In short, it's the longest life of any mirrorless camera I've tested. Compare it to the Fujifilm X-T3 for instance, which in my test managed less than 400 photos or just one hour's worth of 4K video cut into two clips too on a single charge. The Z battery is by far the highlight of the A6600 and it's number one upgrade over earlier models. The larger battery means a larger grip to accommodate it, and I welcome having more to hold on to with a small body, but personally I wasn't fond of the shape of the A6600's new grip which bulged out as it met the body without providing much of a hooked inner area for your fingertips. The X-T3's grip may be smaller, but feels better to me personally. In the first disappointment on a $1400 flagship body, the A6600 continues to employ a single SD memory card slot, and worse, it still won't exploit the speed of UHS-2 cards. That's an annoying decision for a camera that's otherwise so effective for sports, action and wildlife photography, and after shooting a large burst, especially with RAW in there, you can be left waiting some time for the buffer to clear. Fujifilm's X-T3 has twin SD slots, both of which exploit UHS-2 speeds, and it's also one of the first aspects about the A6600 which might have you considering going up to the full frame A7 III instead. Behind a flap on the left hand side you'll find the A6600's four ports, micro USB, micro HDMI and now both microphone and headphone jacks. The A6600 becomes the first A6000 model to sport a headphone jack and while it's long overdue I'm still pleased to see it here. Along with the bigger battery it's another of the key upgrades over the A6400 and indeed the A6500. The HDMI port will output clean 4K, but sadly there's still no 10 bit available here, whether internal or external. Again, a feature available on the Fujifilm X-T3, and even externally on the cheaper X-T30. Like most new cameras, the A6600 is equipped with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, the former allowing quick remote control, while the latter takes care of seamless location tagging via your phone. It's no different from other recent Sony's, but it still works really well. I was surprised to discover the A6600's hot shoe does not include the new pins introduced on the A7R Mark IV to support a digital connection with the new ECM B1M microphone. Instead, it's Sony's earlier multi-interface shoe, although this will still at least power the ECM B1M mic and support an analog connection without any cables or batteries required. 
So while there's an unnecessary conversion from digital to analog, then back again, with the possibility of an increase in noise in the process, the microphone can still apply its DSP effects and I'll demonstrate them later. In another slightly disappointing move, the A6600 inherits the 2.36 million dot OLED viewfinder introduced back on the A6300 three and a half years ago. Don't get me wrong, it's not bad, but just outclassed in resolution by a number of rivals, again including the Fujifilm X-T3, which sports a 3.69 million dot panel that's more typical on a flagship body in 2019. Now remember, the resolution of the viewfinder does not affect the final image quality, but you do appreciate the extra detail when manually focusing and experience less moire on detailed scenes. I really noticed the difference when framing my wide-angle city views around New York. The A6600 inherits the articulated screen mechanism of the A6400, allowing it to angle down by almost 90 degrees and up by 180 to face you for selfies or vlogging. This represents greater flexibility than the earlier A6500, although it's matched by most models now, including Sony's own cheaper A6100. Do note the X-T3 screen also tilts vertically, but additionally lets you angle it out a little to the side for easier framing in the portrait orientation at high or low angles. Although, of course, the X-T3 screen won't flip forward to face you. Since the main body design hasn't changed, the A6600 inherits the 3-inch 16x9 shaped screen of its predecessors, making it wider than most. This is great when filming 16x9 video as it fills the screen, but when shooting still photos in the native 3x2 shape, the image will be presented in a crop with black bars running down the left and right sides. Sony does exploit this spare area for shooting information, but the active image area for stills remains smaller than rivals with narrower screens. Like other recent Sony bodies, the A6600 allows you to tap to reposition the AF area, including when composing through the viewfinder, but not a great deal else. Infuriatingly, the chunky icons of the function menu remain untappable, as does the main menu system, while in playback Sony ignores years of smartphone intuition by not even allowing you to swipe between images. You can double tap to enlarge the view, then push it around the screen, but Sony really needs to extend its touch functionality on all of its cameras. The A6600 employs the 24 megapixel APS-C sensor introduced on the A6300 three and a half years earlier, which means it also inherits a broad array of 425 face detect autofocus points across the full height and 84% of the width. That's pretty much the entire frame, so there's no need for any upgrades there. Now, some may be disappointed the resolution's not increased, but in terms of photo quality, I've got no complaints. As well, Fujifilm's current lineup offers 26 megapixels, and Canon's pushed the boat out to 32.5 on the M62. I feel 24 or thereabouts remains a sweet spot for resolution, noise, and dynamic range on an APS-C sensor, and I'll show you a bunch of examples in just a moment. Like other recent Sony cameras, the A6600 lets you choose from a variety of autofocus areas, from a variable sized single area through zone to wide, where you hand over the reins entirely to the camera. The A6600, of course, also supports face and eye detection for humans and animals, all updated to Sony's latest real-time tracking versions, and like other models with the same capability, it's eerily good at finding and locking onto an eye quickly and from an impressive distance. I've got to a point now with Sony cameras where I rarely override the wide area mode with real-time tracking as it simply works so well for most subjects that I shoot. Fujifilm may now offer phase detect autofocus across its entire frame, but Sony's eye and overall tracking software remains the most confident in the business in my view. Burst speeds are unchanged from the A6300, which means a top mechanical speed of 11 frames per second with autofocus, or 8 frames per second if you'd like live-ish feedback between frames. By sticking with the same capabilities as the A6300 from three and a half years ago, Sony's allowed rivals to now offer faster speeds, including the Fujifilms, which offer 20 frames per second if you switch to their electronic shutter, while Canon's M62 boasts a 14 frames per second mode. Here's a bunch of bursts I shot with the A6600 to show it in action. While there are now faster bursts available from rival models, I'm personally satisfied by a top speed of 11 frames per second and find the reliability of an autofocus system more important. But as before, if you do need to follow erratic subjects on the A6600, it's easier to do so at the slightly slower speed of 8 frames per second, that's the H mode with live-ish feedback, and that still gives you plenty of images to choose from. That said, the exact same burst capabilities are available in the A6500, A6400, A6300 and now even the entry-ish level A6100 at almost half the price and I'm disappointed Sony still hasn't taken the opportunity to update the shutter mechanism to support speeds faster than 1 over 4000. 
After all, most flagship rivals at this price point should offer a 1 over 8000 mechanical shutter. I mentioned it earlier, but it's worth repeating that not only does the A6600 still only have one card slot, but it's limited to UHS-1 speeds, which means you can be waiting a while for a full buffer to clear after a long burst or a bunch of raw images. You can see the images counting down in the corner here. During this time, the camera can still shoot pictures though and enter some menus, but other functions may be locked. The sensor may be the same as the 3.5-year-old A6300, but the A6600 employs Sony's latest image processing, Refined, on the A6400 a few months ago. I'll show you some examples in a moment. The A6600 becomes the second body in the A6000 series to offer built-in stabilization, inheriting the exact same capabilities as the A6500. This shifts the sensor to stabilize any lens you attach, and like the A6500 before it, with variable results depending on your movement at the time. Here's the view when composing at 55mm without stabilization, and my wobbling is pretty clear. With steady shot enabled in the menu though, the view is temporarily wobbly, but after a second or so of holding the shutter release down, the system kicks in to deliver a far more stable view. Letting go of the shutter or AF button though disengaged the stabilization with the wobbles returning, so for the steadiest view when composing, you'll need to keep it pressed. In my test, the built-in stabilization may not have delivered the eerie floating effect of the best models out there, I'm looking at you Panasonic and Olympus, but still proved beneficial for static shooting. That said, it was less successful when I was walking and filming, as I'll show you later. Now for a bunch of sample JPEGs I took with the A6600 fitted with one of the two new E-mount lenses launched alongside it. You're mostly going to be looking at the new 16-55mm f2.8 here, but the longer shots are from the new 70-350mm telephoto zoom, and I'll have reviews of both of these lenses soon. As I mentioned earlier, the A6600 inherits the image processing of the recent A6400, which means it shares the best looking colours and tones of the series to date. Gone are the often artificial looking colours of earlier models, especially the original A6000, and in their place are much more natural results with really crisp details. Sure, the actual resolution has not increased since the A6000, but as an owner of that original model I can tell you the photos now look a great deal better. Put it this way, I certainly don't miss the extra megapixels of the latest Fujifilm and especially Canon APS-C models, and I feel the decision to stick with 24 megapixels is fine for the photo side of things. Some may prefer the colour and tonal approach of Canon or Fujifilm, but it's really down to personal preference. Certainly for urban and natural landscapes, I really like the output from the Sony, but take a look at my sample images here and at Cameralabs.com with a fresh eye and let me know what you think. To illustrate the impact of noise at high sensitivities, I shot this scene at all ISO values and will show you the area marked by the red rectangle in closer detail. Unfortunately, at the time I made this video, Adobe hadn't yet supported the A6600's raw files, so I'm only presenting crops from JPEGs out of camera here. I'll update my review at Cameralabs.com when I can process the raw files, or of course you can always just check out the results from the earlier A6400, which shares exactly the same sensor and image processing. So let me know what you think of the photo quality in the comments. Moving on, the A6600 includes an interval timer, but unlike many cameras won't go as far as to assemble a time-lapse video from them in camera. There aren't any bulb timers or directly accessible shutters longer than 30 seconds either, so long exposure photographers will need to use the bulb mode with some kind of remote release. This can at least be done via the app on your phone though. Offering some additional consolation to time-lapse movie fans is the S and Q mode, which stands for slow and quick. This lets you capture pictures at 1 to 120 frames per second, before then outputting them as a 1080p video. If you choose to capture at 1 frame per second and output in 60p, you'll effectively speed up the video by 60 times. This may end up satisfying your time-lapse desires, but it's limited to 1080p when most rivals can generate 4K time-lapses in camera. The A6600 inherits the movie quality, video autofocus and unlimited recording of the A6400 before it, with the only new real feature for movies being support for eye detection. But since face detection already works so well, it's not a significant upgrade over the cheaper model. So, as before, you can film uncropped 1080 video at 24, 25, 30, 50 or 60p, or at 100 or 120p with a mild crop for slow motion. Fans of 24p will be pleased Sony still allowing it when Canon strangely neglecting 24p on its non-cinema cameras. Set the A6600 to 4K and you can film uncropped footage oversampled from 6K's worth of data in 24 or 25p, or you can opt for 30p which incurs a mild crop. 
4K video is available at 60 or 100 megabit rates. There may be no 4K above 30p, nor any 10-bit recording, internal or external, all of which is available in the Fujifilm X-T3, but there's no arguing with the quality of Sony's oversampled 4K footage, at least at 24 and 25p. Here's an example I filmed in 4K at 24p, and it's absolutely jam-packed with detail. If you prefer to grade your footage, there's the usual array of picture profiles available, including S-Log2, S-Log3, and HLG, although again, no 10-bit option. Here's that same scene again in 4K at 24p, but in S-Log3, which now operates at a base sensitivity of 500 ISO. Note the entry level A6100 lacks picture profiles, so the flattest footage you'll get from that model is when you choose the neutral creative style. Now here's the normal version without picture profiles for comparison. And now for the same scene filmed in 4K at 30p at the same focal length, so you can see the impact of the crop at this frame rate. It's interesting that this has been a limitation on all Sony cameras since they adopted 4K, where most rivals now offer uncropped 4K up to 30p, and sometimes only crop when filming 4K at 50 or 60p. To compare the quality between 4K at 24p and 30p, I refilmed a 24p clip with the lens slightly zoomed in a bit to match the field of view, and I've pictured this in the top half of the screen, while the 30p version is in the lower half, which looks better to you on your screen. And now for a comparison between 4K 24p in the top half and 1080 24p in the bottom half. Sony's 1080 is traditionally beaten in quality by the best of its rivals, but if you're happy with the frame rates up to 30p, you can always film in 4K and downsample to 1080 for really great looking results. Now here's the full 1080p image followed by the A6600 in 1080 at 120p, again at the same focal length to illustrate the crop in the field of view compared to 1080 up to 60p or 4k up to 25p which all use the full sensor width. Now for a selection of clips I filmed with the A6600 in 1080 at 120p all slowed by five times on my 24p timeline here. Now there's nothing new here compared to other recent Sony bodies but they still remain ahead of rivals when filming in 1080 slow motion as Sony's the only company to also capture sound and offer autofocus while filming in this mode. They also let you choose what frame rate to play the footage back on your timeline later rather than baking it in like most others. This makes it easy to switch frame rates and dip in and out of slow motion on the same clip, while also recording sound and staying focused if you need it. So while there's nothing new here for Sony, their 1080 slow motion remains more flexible than Rivals, but do know it is also available on the cheaper A6100. Sony is also one of the only companies besides Panasonic to offer unlimited movie recording times beyond the usual 30 minute limit. And while Panasonic reserves it for a handful of specialist models, Sony has been rolling it out on pretty much everything since the A6400. But where the A6400's smaller battery ran out after around one hour's worth of 4K, the bigger battery in the A6600 allowed me to record a single 4K 24p clip beyond three hours without even having to reduce the overheating warning. You can see it here passing the 3 hour mark with 8% of the battery remaining. It ended up recording 3 hours, 25 minutes and 17 seconds of 4K 24p at 60 megabits per second in a single clip measuring 89 gigabytes. That's seriously impressive stuff for anyone recording events, interviews or lectures and it's way beyond anything its rivals can do. I keep going on about Fujifilm's X-T3, but it can only record half hour 4K clips up to 30p and only two of them on a single battery charge. As mentioned earlier, the only new feature in the A6600's movie mode, beyond the ability to exploit the big battery of course, is eye detection and you're watching an example here filmed with the E16-55mm at 35mm f2.8. The camera briefly loses me for a moment but locks back on again as I move back and forth and in the menus you can always adjust the AF speed and tracking sensitivity if desired. You're unlikely to actually exploit the eye detection in movies unless filming with bright telephoto lenses but the overall face and subject tracking works as well as Canon's dual pixel CMOS AF and allows you to trust both technologies for keeping you in focus as you present a piece to camera. Now Fujifilm is getting better with each generation, but it lacks the ultimate confidence of Canon and Sony in this regard. Before my traditional vlogging test, I wanted to talk about stabilisation, which is built into the A6600 and a key benefit it enjoys over the Fujifilm X-T3 and anything made by Canon. It's only Sony's second APS-C camera with built-in stabilisation, inheriting it wholesale from the A6500. As such, it may not be the best on the market, but it's still useful in certain situations. 
Here's a clip I filmed at 55mm with an unstabilized lens and stabilization turned off in the camera and as you can see is pretty shaky. The shakiness also unfortunately highlights the susceptibility for rolling shutter on this camera. And now with stabilization in the camera enabled where the result is much steadier although not floating as eerily as Panasonic or Olympus cameras. Here's another example again at 55mm with stabilization off before now turning it on again for a much steadier result. In both of these examples the built-in stabilization proved very beneficial but note the camera and subject were not in deliberate motion. In this third example I'm walking with the A6600 at just 16mm with stabilization disabled and the expected wobbles are quite visible. But now here's the stabilized version and as you can see there's actually very little evidence of the stabilization in action. It looks a lot like my own stabilized clip right? This is sadly a similar result to the A6500 before it and means vloggers will have to take care or ideally use a gimbal. Now here's what you can expect from the camera alone along with some bonus tests of the ECM B1M microphone in action on this body. Let the vlogging test commence. Hi I'm Gordon from Camera Labs and this is a quick vlogging test with the Sony A6600. A camera that's probably going to prove very popular with the vlogging community because it ticks a few important boxes. First is very respectful face and eye detection when recording video, I'm using both of those right now. Second is decent quality video itself, I'm filming this in 4K at 24p where the camera oversamples from 6K's worth of information, it looks really crisp and detailed. I'm also using uh, the new 16-55mm to f2.8 zoom at 16mm f2.8 so hopefully we should be getting a nice shallow depth of field effect. I'm also using the built-in microphones but I'll show you an upgrade in audio in just a moment. Now the other box it ticks for vloggers is built-in stabilisation which shifts the sensor. Now believe it or not I'm using that right now. This lens does not have optical stabilisation so it's sensor shift only right now. Now this uses the same system as the A6500 so unfortunately it's not the most effective around. There are better stabilised cameras available. However it's better than nothing and in fact I'll show you right now what nothing looks like. Okay so this is what it looks like with stabilisation turned off. So this is a completely unstabilised system that you're looking at here. And one of the other problems with this camera is that it is susceptible quite a lot to rolling shutter. So you're really going to notice that with the wobble. So really if you are into vlogging with this you're going to need to be steadier than I am. And you're also probably going to need to use a gimbal or something like that. However I'm going to switch it back on again now and also show you the benefit of an external microphone. Okay now I've switched to an external microphone. The new Sony ECM B1M digital microphone. But before you get too excited there's two downsides to using this. First anything you mount on the hot shoe like this is going to block the screen so it no longer flips up to face me I have no idea even if I'm recording here so that's a, a bit of a downside the second thing is, is that this camera can work with this microphone but not through the digital interface it's using an analog connection now before you get too upset about that it is still doing it without any cables, it's doing it without any batteries, it's getting that from the camera itself. So it's still pretty neat, it's just that once it's sampled and played around with that audio, it has to change it back into analog in order to get it into the camera's hot shoe and then that converts it back to digital again, blah blah blah. More importantly though, I've got this uh, microphone set to its omnidirectional mode here where it should be picking up the sounds from all around me so I'm now going to turn it into a more directional microphone. So now I'm using the super directional mode which turns this microphone more into a uh, shotgun, something much more hopefully precisely listening to me and not so much to the surroundings. Hopefully this is really good for vlogging in a noisy environment like this one. And remember you're achieving those two different patterns and there's a middle one as well with just one microphone so it's pretty convenient but this microphone has one other trick and that is noise cancelling with the DSP so I'm going to activate that right now. Okay so now I'm using the super directional mode with digital noise cancelling enabled. This is using the microphone's internal DSP to actually cancel out some of the surrounding noise. Hopefully it's being effective. When it works it works really well. When it doesn't work it sounds like I'm in a, a toilet to be frank. Not that I do a lot of vlogging within toilets. I think this uh, clip's going downhill because of that right now. So I'm going to stop and uh, let's get on with the rest of the review. During all these handheld clips you can see how easily the A6600 succumbs to rolling shutter. It's been a problem since the A6300 introduced this sensor three and a half years earlier and every model to use the same sensor suffers from the same issues. 
To be fair, most other cameras also suffer from rolling shutter to some regard, but the light body and modest stabilisation means you may notice it more on the A6600, so do film with caution. Before wrapping up, a quick note on lenses. The A6600 can use any E-mount lens designed for APS-C or full-frame bodies with a 1.5 times field reduction, and this gives it access to over 50 native lenses from Sony alone. Now, while Sony has concentrated on its full-frame lineup recently, I'm delighted that they launched two new E-mount zooms designed specifically for APS-C bodies alongside the A6600 and A6100. First, there's the E16-55mm to mm f2.8G, the bright, constant aperture high-end zoom Sony's better APS-C cameras were always crying out for. At last! I shot with this lens mounted on the A6600 almost exclusively and loved the results. Crisp across the frame, even at f2.8, and capable of some lovely shallow depth of field effects. Now, it's not cheap at $1400, nor does it have optical image stabilisation for the older bodies, but it's still a desirable compact, bright, high performance option. Then there's the new E70 to 350mm f4.5 to 6.3 GOSS, a telephoto zoom again designed for APS-C sensors only, costing around $1000. This slightly undercuts the full frame FE70 to 300mm while offering a little extra reach. Look out for my reviews of both of these lenses. And now for my final verdict. The A6600 builds upon the series so far to become Sony's most powerful APS-C mirrorless camera to date. Like many new cameras, it combines or enhances elements from existing models, so at the heart is the 24 megapixel sensor introduced on the A6300 from three and a half years ago with its broad and confident autofocus coverage, 11 frames per second burst and oversampled 4K video up to 30p. The screen, which angles all the way up to face you, coupled with unlimited movie recording times, comes from the A6400. The built-in stabilisation is inherited wholesale from the A6500. While the high-capacity battery, making its debut here on an A6000 model, comes from the full-frame A9 and third-generation A7 bodies. The addition of a headphone jack and eye detection in movies are also first for an A6000 body, but seen before in the full-frame series. Sony's strategy of equipping new low-end models with its best features means much of what makes the A6600 compelling is also available at a cheaper price in the range. Indeed, the entry-ish level A6100 launched alongside it at almost half the price shares the same photo and video quality, much the same autofocus and burst shooting, unlimited movie recording and the same screen articulation. The A6400 comes even closer, matching the A6600's build quality, viewfinder resolution and picture profiles, but still with a $500 saving. This $500 premium for the A6600 gets you four main benefits over the A6400, albeit losing the pop-up flash in the process. In reverse order of usefulness, in my view anyway, there's eye detection in movies, which is nice if you're shooting with long and large aperture lenses like the FE 135mm f1.8, but won't make that much difference in general filming as the existing face detection was already very effective. Second is the headphone jack, a very useful addition for filmmakers, allowing them to monitor the sound being recorded by the camera, and it's a first for the A6000 series. Third is the built-in stabilisation, which in my test proved useful for photos or static video compositions, but like the A6500 before it, proved less effective at ironing out wobbles as I walked, making it less compelling for vloggers. The fourth, and for me the number one upgrade, is the battery life, which thanks to the Z series pack now comfortably outlasts any other mirrorless camera, at least those which use single packs. I managed over 900 shots or almost three and a half hours of 4K video in a single clip too on a full charge. This is by far the highlight of the camera in my view and what makes it unique in the market. What you still won't get on an A6000 body though are twin memory card slots or indeed even a single card slot that exploits UHS 2 speeds, a viewfinder resolution that's better than 2.36 million dots, shutter speeds that are faster than 4,000th of a second, a hot shoe with the A7R4's digital pins to fully exploit the new digital microphone, a USB-C port, an AF joystick, menu navigation with a touchscreen, or 4K that's above 30p or in 10-bit. I feel that most of the physical limitations are down to recycling a body mostly inherited from the 3.5-year-old A6300 and a shutter mechanism which may be even older. Now, I know Sony loves its small bodies, but if increasing it only a little could allow twin card slots and improve stabilisation, then I'd say go for it. 
There's also no getting away from the price, which at $1,400 is close to the Fujifilm X-T3, which may not have built-in stabilization, unlimited recording, a forward-facing screen, or as long a battery life, but it does have twin UHS-2 slots, a high-resolution viewfinder, sideways screen articulation, and 4K up to 60p or in 10-bit. There's a lot to weigh up between these two models. For me though, the biggest rival is arguably Sony's own a7 III, which may be closer to $2,000, but gives you full frame, better stabilization, twin card slots, an AF joystick, USB-C, and while the screen won't face you, it does at least have the Z battery and headphone jack. What makes the a7 III even more compelling though, is if you're buying a full frame lens at the same time. For example, the a6600 with the new 16 to 55 2.8, costs approximately the same as an a7 III with the Tamron 28-75mm f2.8 and that's a really nice lens. Then there's that thorny $500 premium over the a6400 or $650 premium over the a6100, both of which share the same photo and movie quality. Now both these bodies obviously lack stabilization and the big battery, but you could equip either of them with a small but decent gimbal like the Chuyun WeBuild Lab and enjoy far better stabilization, along with say connecting a USB battery for extended life and still come in cheaper than the A6600, although you won't get the headphone jack. So as much as I enjoyed shooting with the A6600, especially when fitted with the lovely 16-55mm f2.8, and I do appreciate Sony's continued development of APS-C, potential buyers really have to ask themselves how much they'd exploit those four key upgrades over the A6400. They also have to ask themselves whether the alternative feature set of the Fujifilm X-T3 better suits their needs. Or indeed, if the dream APS-C camera they truly desire actually already exists in the form of the a7 III with the bonus of full frame. That said, if you do want Sony's steadily refined photo and movie quality, coupled with industry-leading autofocus in the smallest body with the longest battery in the business, then the a6600 is for you. Right, that's the end of this video. If you found any of it useful, do give me a like, and if you haven't already subscribed, I'd really appreciate you giving me a follow. Thanks. If you really like what I do, don't forget you can support my work by treating me to a coffee or treating yourself to a Camera Labs t-shirt or my in-camera book and there's links to all of this along with checking prices on the gear I've mentioned in the description and pinned comments below. As always, I'd love to hear what you think of Cerny's revised lineup of bodies and lenses, so leave a comment and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.